Welcome back to the Golf Smarter Podcast, Dr. Joe. Pleasure to be here, Fred. It is great to have you on to help us celebrate the beginning of our 11th year on the Golf Smarter Podcast. Has it been, has it been 10 years since we were on? For the, yeah. We were on the first show, right? That's right. Episode number one, and I brag about it all the time, that episode <laughs> number one was Dr. Joseph Perrin of Zen Golf, and that that episode is just as valid today as it was when we recorded it 10 years ago because the content you know, is strong and doesn't really change for golfers. Well, it's been so exciting. We've been in the Zen Golf has been in the top 10 in sales on Amazon uh, since it came out. And that was almost 14 years ago. Amazing. Yeah, Amazing. it's pretty yeah. cool. Pretty cool. I wish I could take some of the credit for getting <laughs> this. Well, I'm not you, going you, to it. You can have content. some. You can no, have some. Content is king. It's been great. And, uh, and what's really exciting. Uh, I went to a meeting. We had a lot of junior golfers uh, as part of a program that we'll talk about later when we talk about the movie that I'm taking part in. But oh, uh, all these junior golfers saying, I, you know, your book is what I, is how I play the game. And, and these are kids who basically were two years old when the book was written. Wow. So when it first when it first came out. So these are 16 and 17 year old kids. And uh, we just got a Twitter, a tweet from somebody. You know, so people are picking it up still for the first time. And that's what's exciting for me. Oh, absolutely. And it's it, what's so great about this is the type of book that you can read again and again and again and get something new every time that you read it. Well, thank you. I, I, and that's something else that I I take pride in uh, of how many times people say, uh, I'm on my 14th, I'm on my fourth read of, of it. And I actually, one person said, I read it every year at the start of the golf season, just to get my head straight to, uh, for, for the rest of the year. Wow. That's, that's pretty impressive. Um, I, I wish I could say <laughs> same but i don't but i refer to it all the time because it makes such right. an impact and, you know that's that's what happened i mean i started this podcast because your book had such a strong impression on me well thank and you I, I wanted it you know i just felt like everyone talking about mechanics and it's like no 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 no. It, it, there's got to be something else and um so what can we offer to to the the people on the podcast who haven't heard me for a while and uh, and new listeners well, and, I, view, and viewers, yeah, and Fun viewers too. On we're live on, the world yeah, we're has live on Blab. Since we first were on ten years ago. Isn't that amazing? Because yeah. ten years ago, I remember having to explain what a podcast was, and now right. I have to explain what Blab is. <laughs> That's it. Exactly. Not much different. Um, you know what I would like to talk about, and it's interesting that you brought up these young kids. Um, we're going to talk about a lot of different things, and and we invite the audience to participate since we are live on Blab. Um, they can uh, type in questions, go uh, slash Q, type in your question, and we'll pop it up on the screen for Dr. Joe. But the, um, the, it's so interesting because we're you know, reviewing the 2015 PGA season and LPGA season. Right. Um, and there's a youth movement going on. Clearly, there's a youth movement going on that would have been unheard of two decades ago. You know, it's young guns don't come up and dominate the tour the way they do. Well, two now. decades ago, the young gun was Tiger Woods, and that was 1997, a little less than two decades ago. But he, you know, we 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 had hoped that there would be some that came along with him. But basically, it was him alone challenging the the older generation and dominating the older generation. And now we've got. Uh, uh, Jason, you know, uh, Jordan Spieth, Jason Day, Ricky Fowler, and Rory McIlroy. So all in their twenties. Um, all in their twenties. Uh, I w I thought, wow, what a great made-for-TV event. Uh, you know, um, Jordan and Ricky, the American golfers, against Jason and uh, and Rory from Ireland and Australia. So that would be that would be pretty cool. Very cool. It's very cool. But uh, the thing that blows me away is, you know, these young golfers, um, they're obviously very well trained. They hit the ball a mile. I think that's changed the game tremendously. But I've always been so amazed at their mental 
capacity, that their maturity on the golf course, which I think when Tiger came along, people were blown away. It's like, how can this kid be so mature? You know, and there was the whole Zen upbringing that he had. Mm -hmm. um, and now it just seems to be normal. Well, I, I wouldn't say that. I think that there are, are um, some of the young players have that kind of focus. But what what I think, and I'm I'm really proud of the fact that in the last 14 years, the notion of Zen golf and working on the mental game has become so prominent and so well recognized that that makes the difference. And and I, I want your listeners and viewers to understand that the mental game doesn't, it, it's not going to add yards to what you're capable of. It will clear the interference so that you can hit it as far as you possibly can. It, it doesn't make you more accurate, but it takes away the shots that go sideways so that it, it clears the interference so that you can be as accurate as you possibly can. Uh, what what you could say is a golfer's potential is their skill level uh, when there is no interference, when their mental game capacity is at its peak. And what happens when pressure comes, the mental game capacity drops. So the performance, there's a gap in the performance. The reason Tiger was so tough to beat, his mental game was so strong that this was his capability level, and he almost played at full capacity the whole time. So his mental game didn't take anything away from his, his uh, capacities, his skill levels, where everybody else, they started below his skill level and got diminished. And that was why he dominated by so, by such, such a great extreme uh, amount. Now, what I think is, uh, is impressive is that the players today, the young players today know that that's what they need to work on. So they work on it a lot more than the players of the previous generation who, if they had it, they had it. And, you know, what they said was, well, it comes from experience. Right. And now they know that, no, you have to train in it. Like it, it, it's as if saying, well, you know, I just play golf and that's, that's how I get in shape. But Tiger changed that, you know, and Greg Norman and Gary player all, all focused on being in better physical shape and that let them play golf and uh, let them play golf better. So that became pretty well recognized. So everybody hit the, the uh, physical workout trailer and now they need to hit the mental game workout trailer. <laughs> and everybody seems to have a mental coach with them. In, well, uh, as not not everybody, but you know, that's the thing. Uh, unlike having a physical trainer, which you need to have with you almost every week, having a mental game coach that you can check in with. Like I, I work with Christy Kerr, but I only see her mm, two or three times a year. The rest okay. of the time we're texting or, or on the phone. Uh, it's, uh, and that, that's fine for working on the mental game. And it's one less person around, you know, in the crowd, uh, which which the more people around a player, it's good to have a team, but they they're also taking taking some of the energy. So you got to be you got to find a balance there. I'm curious. You you talk about your communication with Christy Kerr, uh, texting emails. How does who initiates and that? And phone calls. And phone, and phone calls. calls. I'm I'm curious about like. Just texting. Is is that something that she initiates? You initiate because we, have, we make a plan. We make a plan at the beginning of the year, mm. and uh, and we've worked enough years that we we already know the plan, which is that um, she's going to check in with me on Monday or Tuesday, and if I haven't heard from her by Tuesday evening, I say want to check in, and she'll either say no, I'm good. Or she'll say, "Let's talk tomorrow," um, and and we make an appointment to to get on the phone. And then during the tournament, I basically look at her scores and say, "You know, keep on keeping on," <laughs> when she's playing well. <laughs> or I remind her to stay focused and 
you know, just just what whatever one of the keys that we talked about earlier in the week are, and and just send a little send a little reminder. Um, so uh, if she and and if something's going on that she can't figure out, then we get on we get on the phone and talk. Uh, and sometimes if she's playing in Asia, I get up at four at two in the morning to have that conversation with her. <laughs> whatever whatever it takes. Yeah, wherever she is wherever she is. Um, so uh, do you watch the tournaments that she's in and then you kind of, uh, you know, take notes for yourself? How do you? Oh, I watch the tournaments. Work? I can't control what pictures they take. It's great to see. Yeah. And if I see something, uh, I can let her know. And, and what I, I mainly want to do is reinforce what she's doing well. Golfers, as you know, uh, are pretty good critics of themselves. So <laughs> that's a nice way to put on it. and saying, you really didn't look committed to that one and, and have your player say, yeah, tell me something I didn't know. Uh, mm -hmm. So I don't need to do that so much as to reinforce uh, the shots that it, you know, it looked like she really was there and present. And we, we have an, uh, I'll, I'll share an interesting thing, which I'm, I'm sure is okay with Christy. We have a formula. Uh, for our our focus is on a particular kind of score, and it's not a usual golf score. What we focus on was how many shots she played with full commitment. And full commitment meaning she was ready when it was time to play, and there was uh, no holding back, no guiding, no doubt about the about making the swing that she planned to make and playing the shot that she planned to play. And when she makes 80% of her shots full commitment, she knows she's going to be in, in contention. 90% wow. she's going to win, which uh, is pretty much what happened in the last tournament of the year this year, the CME Tour Championship. And when she won the LPGA Championship by a record margin of 12 strokes, keep in mind, she, she shot 19 under and, set, and the, the second best score was 7 under. Wow. which is a really remarkable difference on a golf course. It's, it's pretty much similar to what when Tiger won the, the U S open at Pebble beach and shot 15 over. And I think the next closest score was 15. He shot 15 under and the next closest score was two under something like that. So well, it, and Jordan it, this year dominated the um, majors. And when, when she did that, that record margin of victory, she had 98% fully committed shots. In other words, only six shots in four days was she not fully committed to. And, and that's an incredible state of mind. That's totally being in the zone. Yeah. Yeah. Is that something she reported to you? She said 96% or how yeah, did we, you get to that? Yeah. We, you we, that? Well, the number we figured out, she said, I can only think of half a dozen shots that I wasn't fully committed. And then okay. we did the math. <laughs> but yeah, right. that's pretty pretty much where it came out so i you know i wanted to share with the uh with the listeners and go back uh 10 years to something that still applies and i still teach it and it still makes the difference for for people and that's the par approach that i came up with that that's the kind of the mainstay of zen golf there's our there's the uh, a classic there you go. And, and that is, uh, you take care of your preparation, which is a clear picture of what you want to accomplish, uh, a, a commitment, as we just talked about with Christy, to the shot you want to play, and some composure. And we work a lot with breathing and breathing your energy down and, and, and getting very grounded. And when you have that, then you can have the action part. So P is for preparation, A is for action. And that action part is, is swinging with playing the shot without interference, without the interference of particularly of worry about results. And uh, something that, that Christy came up with when, because this, this is the main source of interference from beginners to accomplished world number one players. When they get in their own way, it's worry about results. Uh, and Christy, 
came up with the acronym for her. She likes acronyms. So acronyms, those the first letters of worry about result are W A R. And well, when you worry about results, <laughs> when you worry about results, you're at war with yourself. Yeah. And I said, Oh, that is so right on. That is absolutely it. So that's the that. action. The action part is making a swing that you're completely focused on the process without worrying about the results. And then the R is the your response to results. And you want to reinforce the good shots. When it's when it's not a great shot, you don't want to pick out what's wrong with it. You want to say, oh, that was close. Hmm. And uh, and focus on how you could have made it a little bit better. And then when you hit one of those stinkers that doesn't have any redeeming value, instead of saying what's wrong with me, you say, where did that come from? That's right. not my regular swing. What got in the way? And usually at that uh, that kind of shot, it's something mental. Yeah. And then you have you just go back. And so it's a cycle of continuous improvement. You go back to the beginning and say, how was my preparation? Did I have a clear picture or was I playing an avoiding shot with a negative image? Did I have com a commitment or was I second guessing myself? Did I have composure or was I trying to get it over with or rushing it or, or anxious? And, and once you work on that, s that system, that cycle, you can get better as you play. And that's what I think has been the exciting thing about Zen golf of players who are shooting their lower scores without changing their swing. They're just getting out of their own way and getting the most out of the abilities they have. Uh, one, one of the two of my all time favorite Dr. Joe lines is getting out of your own way and you made the putt. You just didn't hole it. Yes. That's uh, my <laughs> latest, my latest golf book is how to make every putt right which hey if you got it started the way you want it that's all you can control they don't let you shovel it along into the all the way to the hole they don't let you carry it and put it in the hole all you can do is get the ball started rolling if you if you got it rolling with a good stroke on the path you wanted at the pace you wanted you made your putt and then you look to see how the ball does about going in the hole and and the change in people's confidence level because on the PGA Tour, the average from eight feet is 50%. So I describe a PG, an average PGA uh, Tour putting round. I say, well, God, that, that guy missed half his putts from eight feet. That doesn't sound like a very good putter. Right. Yet that's the average for the best players in the world. So you don't want your confidence based on how many you hold because anything further than eight feet, you're, you, the odds are you won't hold it. Right. Um, so what you want to base your confidence on is getting it started and giving it a chance. And once you do a better job of that, then if it doesn't do what you thought it was going to do, then you, then you get better at reading putts and, and your game improves and improves and improves. So uh, uh, I think that what I've heard, uh, I have a couple of uh, one other one that I think you've told me in the past was a big favorite. And that is people think that if they played better, they'd enjoy the game more. And I think it's the other way around. If you enjoyed the game more, you'd play better. Absolutely. I love that. That's one of my favorites. Yeah. I actually, uh, we had, um, Oh, who was it? Well, we had a, 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 a caddy on a PGA tour caddy. I'm blanking on, whose caddy it was at the time but he said he goes look it if you're having fun you're a good golfer it's like thank you for that permission i mean it was such right. a such a great thing to say and it's like stop beating yourself up stop getting in your own way enjoy yourself and if you enjoy well, I yourself see, more, i see players and and i can tell whether they feel like they're playing well or not um and the funny thing is they say, well, you know, I'm shooting in the 60s or, you know, these are the pros that are talking. Yeah, 60s right. with my buddies on the, you know, on Tuesday in the practice round. And then I can't break seven during the tournament. Mm -hmm. uh, and and I, I explained to them that they've got it backwards. They're, they're playing on Tuesday and working during the tournament. And they should be working on Tuesday and playing during the tournament. The other thing is uh, when a, a player is playing well and they hit a shot that goes sideways, they go, eh, whatever, one of those, I'll recover, no big deal. 
when they're playing poorly and they hit the same exact shot, they go, what's wrong with my swing? Right. And they start tinkering and messing with it. So, so it's how they respond to the not so good shots that really marks how confident they are. And if they can, if they can just brush off one of the not so good ones as, oh, that that was one of those, uh, then you know that they're on their game. And if if one of those sideways ones sends them into a downward spiral, then you know that that they're lacking in confidence. I was going to ask you to define interference, but you gave such great examples of it. I want to go back to commitment. Um, and what you find, you know, if we're talking about a, an LPGA champion uh, mm -hmm. who's at 96% on one round and, you know, 80% to be in it, what do we do? What, what is the average recreational non-tournament golfer? What kind of commitment do we generally give to a round of 18 holes? Uh, how many com fully committed shots? Yeah, that you've witnessed. A handful. At best. A handful, because we're either worried about where we might hit it, mm -hmm. or we're trying too hard to guide it to where we want it to go, or we, or, you know, we don't trust that we have enough club and we go after a little extra hard, or we don't, or, or we're afraid we have too much club and we, we try to take something off of it in mid swing. Um, it's, it, you know, and almost always there's some quality of worrying about the results. Very rarely do, do you see a completely free swing with no concern for how the shot's going to turn out, but purely wanting to produce the feel that they want. And, and here's the most important thing, trusting that their body is going to produce the feel without their mind, their thinking mind directing them. So I think the biggest source of, uh, one of the biggest sources of interference is not trusting the swing, but giving yourself a lesson while you're swinging. And, and one of the chapters in, in Zen golf is uh, um, during your swing is not a good time to give yourself a lesson. <laughs> it's one, so one of the other ones is um, I think it's. Uh, it's okay. You wrote keep, it 14 never, years ago. <laughs> never keep more than a hundred thoughts in your mind during your swing. Yeah. And I had one student say, I'm trying to get down to a hundred. So if you're giving yourself instruction while you're swinging, you're thinking you're not swinging. If all that's in your mind is a particular feel key and an image of the ball flying to the target, then you're swinging without interference. And, and people say, well, you know, I'm not that good a golfer. How can I trust my swing? Well, what you can trust is that you'll make pretty much the same swing each time in the absence of interference. And that, uh, but you know, the similarity of your swing from one swing to the next is going to be it's going to be a little less similar than than a PGA or LPGA Tour pro who does it for a living and practices swinging a golf club six to eight hours a day. Um, but you can trust that if you get out of your own way and just put as good a swing on it as you can, that's how you're going to get the best results for you. And then yeah. if you see a pattern show up, then go to your go to your swing instructor and work on that. You know, just work on a little bit of it at a time. Don't try to go back to the drawing board and revamp it every time. Most amateurs don't have don't have the time to put into just changing their entire swing. Oh uh, yeah, I, or the or the mindset. Um, the mindset they do because they can practice Zen golf while they play. That's why it works so well for the amateur golfers. Hmm. They can practice while they play. And after they've played a shot, they can evaluate and say, how was my, you know, how was my commitment? How was my composure? How was my clarity of my picture? And work on that in their pre-shot routine and get better at their pre-shot routine, which is going to make them better at playing their shots. So, so that's the, you know, that's the bonus. This is, you know, this book is for people who don't have time 
to practice. I, you know, I, I was giving a corporate talk uh, on performance, on the psychology of performance. And somebody asked me, you know, they said, well, I only play once or twice a week, uh, uh, once or twice a month. And, uh, and can you give me some suggestions on how I can improve my game? And everybody laughed because everybody knows, the, how are you going to do that without practicing? And I said, yes, I can give you a suggestion on how you can improve your game. Cultivate your sense of humor. If you only play once or twice a month and you don't have any time to practice, then the only thing that's going to make you better is not getting upset about your shots. Right. Yeah. Lose all expectations. Exactly. Let, let that go. Um, but most players, I ask them, you know, how much, you know, how many times a week do you practice? And most people say once. And I say, um, is that right? Is that right before your round? And they say, yes. And then I asked, that's not practice. Question. That's not practice. That's warming up. I said, how many right. times do you practice either after a round or when you're not playing? And all the hands went down. Nobody does. So, uh, yeah. So if you want to get better um, and you're not somebody who practices, then the only thing you're going to get better at is the mental game. Right. And that's going to help. I mean, that's, that was the whole premise of Golf Smarter. Mm -hmm. Right. If you have if you have a strong mental game and you understand the strategy of what you have to do from from the flag back to the tee, given your um, capabilities, you, given your capabilities. Right. Yeah. Well, you're going to be able to improve much faster than if you just worked on swing mechanics. I've so always I have a favorite quote for you from Jack Nicholas that, that is ref that's reflective of what you just said. OK. Ask yourself how many shots you would have saved. If you always developed a strategy before you hit, always played within your capabilities, never lost your temper, and never got down on yourself. Jack Nicholas. It answers a lot of questions. I mean, it, it's, it's so, it seems to be so straightforward until you're out on the golf course and then you start beating yourself up again because things start repeating that you're not trying, that you don't want to happen and you don't understand why, so you tweak and you're, Right. I, I, so I have a question we, for you, Fred. Yes, sir. Ready for you. Okay. Um, what young golfer does that remind you of? What I just described. Uh, Play within your capabilities. Always have a strategy. You know, uh, for managing yourself around the course. Don't lose your temper and don't get down on yourself. I would have to say, for 2015, it was the player that probably dominated the headlines all year round. That sounds like Jordan Spieth to me. Me too. And that's been the exciting thing for me. Uh, Jack Nicholas was my inspiration for even getting involved in teaching the mental game because I saw the power of his mind in playing golf. And he did not get in his own way. He didn't make mistakes, uh, mental mistakes. And that's why all the other players were so afraid of him because they said, well, he's not going to go the other direction. So I better, I better watch out. And Jordan Spieth reminds me so much of how Jack Nicholas plays. They, everybody was amazed at how he managed the course at the Masters. And, and when he missed, he missed in the right places. Right. Uh, and, and his short game was great and helped him get up and down. And unless you have peace of mind, you, you don't have a short game or putting. That, right. that is the main determinant of your short game and putting besides your skills is your focus and your trust and your peace of mind. So uh, Jordan is really, to me, the model of that. Uh, the other player who dominated the headlines towards the end of the year was Jason Day. Jason Day. And yeah. Jason, you can see, everybody can see him visualizing because he stops he takes his deep breath and he closes his eyes and visualizes. And his pre-shot routine is pretty much by the book from, from Zen Golf of, of the clarity of visualizing your shot, feeling committed to it, and then breathing your energy down and getting the composure. So all three, the three C's of preparation that I present in Zen Golf, Jason Day is clearly and, and evidently doing. And a friend of mine, Jason Goldsmith, uh, who's a, uh, uh, a coach here in Southern California, uh, worked on developing something called the Focus Band. 
and it was a monitor to see how jumpy your it's a it is a monitor to see how jumpy your mind is or how much in the zone you are and jason day trained with that device for a couple of years that helped him get to get to number one really so uh, is this a product that's available uh, I think that it is just becoming available. Uh, and um, I'm going to try and uh, be have some connection with that through my website. But I think that if you, you uh, search for focus band in golf, you can probably find it. And, uh, and I'm uh, participating along with Jason and a student of mine who is a filmmaker and he's making a documentary called Be the Ball. Um, this is a, a young man who was given Zen Golf by his brother. Uh, and, and he was kind of a more of a hippy-dippy kind of guy. And why would I play golf? And he got into it and was really turned on by the mental game and came to study with me. And so he has been doing interviews on the PGA Tour and uh, a lot of celebrities. Uh, including Bill Murray and Samuel L. Jackson. He's got some incredible interviews about the mind and spirit uh, and how and the, the part they play in playing golf. And so he's doing this documentary called Be the Ball. And he has um, teamed up with some professors at USC in the neuroimaging department, and they're doing MRIs, and they're going to – we're going to work with a number of golfers to see if a training using the focus band and using my mindfulness techniques combined can improve their mental games in a three month test period and an experiment. And they're gonna be measured by the scientists at USC and it's going to be a, 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 um, an experiment that's going to form the core of the movie. So that's gonna be happening in 2016. Very exciting. Very cool. Very exciting. Uh, the Focus Band can be found online at ifocusband.com. It's the letter I, then focusband.com. And um, it, it's for, they have it for uh, golf, baseball, uh, meditation, in business. Um, lots of opportunities. Let's see here. Uh, it's really, so a, it's really is, a biofeedback kind of tool and, and helps you to recognize uh, and get feedback for when your mind is um, busy thinking as opposed mm -hmm. to when it's calm and clear and in the zone. Uh, and, and it's a great thing to pair with if you, if you go to my website, zengolf.com, you can get my audio books and my videos and, you, and, um, and link to a training in mindful awareness and relaxation training. And you combine the two of those, and I think that you're going to get some uh, some very powerful results. Boy, you had mindfulness. It's mindfulness seems to be on a very very hot topic in 2015. Uh, you are so far ahead of the curve on that one. You mean because I started teaching it in 1975? <laughs> that could yeah, be. I guess that, so. could, that could be it. Could, it could make you ahead <laughs> of the curve. Uh, and wow. that's, you know, that's why it was Zen Golf. That why it was, it's so amazing that this little book has um, has really made such a difference. But uh, I think it was ahead of the curve, and and people keep catching on to it and recognize that 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 mindfulness in everything you do. You know, I, I one of my, another favorite saying of mine is it's like what you uh, see on a little raffle ticket. You know, what's printed mm -hmm. on a raffle ticket. You must be present to win. <laughs> so if you remember that, if your, mind, mind, if your mind is in the future worrying about results or in the past thinking about a bad shot you hit before, you're not present and you won't win. I think that could be the title of another book. Oh, I've got you it's in it's one of the chapters in the in, there you uh, in the new book. In in the new That's, book. New book. Okay. Segway. Let, let, <laughs> tell me more about the new book. Well, I'll, 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 I'll start with earlier this year. I came out with Zen Tennis there. Okay. Playing in the zone that I wrote with Bill Scanlon. 
who was famous for getting in the zone and beating players ranked far above him. Uh, he got to number nine in the world, so they weren't that far above. But um, when he was just in the top 20, he beat John McEnroe, who was ranked number one in the world and seeded favorite to win the U.S. Open. And Bill got in the zone. And we tell stories of his play in the zone and how that reflects a lot of what I'm teaching uh, of Zen, uh, the Zen principle, the mindfulness principles that help get you there. So, so we have stories of how Bill played in the zone and my instructions on how you can play in the zone in tennis and anything else you do. And yeah, so is that now, applicable now, for golf as well? What? It's applicable for golf as well. Well, it takes, right? it's really taking the principles from Zen golf. So if you yeah, have that, you have those principles. And But tennis is a little different, so it, it expands it from the golf principles and applies them to tennis. But we're going to go even beyond that. And this is Tell coming out January 1st. The best diet book ever, Zen and the Art of Losing Weight. Uh, that is a little bit of a turn from what you've been doing. Well, it's still performance. And a lot of the yeah. principles in Zen golf of mindfulness and the habit changing techniques that I present for people to oh. change the habit of negative self-talk and getting in their own way. Well, it's about getting out of your own way because what is the most common New Year's resolution? Diet. I'm going to lose weight. Right? That's right. And what's the least successful New Year's resolution? Losing weight. So we're, <laughs> Losing we're, weight and going to the gym. <laughs> We're going to help them out. That's right. So we're going to help people out. And the exciting thing about this is there are no recipes or menus. And that's because <laughs> food fads come and go and change all the time. Um, right. You can you can uh, get on you can get on the list to advance order at thebestdietbookever.com. That's my website. <laughs> that is the such best a great diet book ever. Dot com, uh, and the book's going to be coming out January 1st to help you recover from your holiday eating. Uh, a lot of the Zen stories uh, are, and some new ones from Zen Golf are, are in here. But really, the principle is taking a look at your habits. And what happens is we overeat and then we feel bad and beat ourselves up. And then we kind of try to put it out of our mind and then engage in the same habits over and over again. So sure. what this will teach you is, again, how to get out of your own way. And you don't lack willpower. You just don't know how to access it. You don't lack mm -hmm. confidence. You just don't know how to access it. So this will teach you how to do that. And I'll give you a quick summary of what gets in the way in people's eating habits. I call them the three twos, T-O-O. -O. Okay. Eating too much. Okay. Too fast for too long. So Pretty if simple. we work on mindful eating, we can be mindful of how much we're taking. Are our eyes bigger than our stomach? Or are we taking a reasonable portion? Then if you eat more slowly, you actually enjoy the food more. Instead of shoveling it, just shoveling it, you taste each bite. And we discovered a really amazing thing. When you set your utensils down in between bites, you just set them down and put your hands in your lap, your shoulders relax, your jaw relaxes, you chew more slowly, you breathe, you enjoy the food more, and you realize how full you are sooner. So the three, the remedies for the three twos are the three S's. You take smaller portions, mm -hmm. you enjoy them, you savor the flavor and eat more slowly. That's the second S, slowly. Okay. And you stop sooner. So um. when you do that, if you exercise the same amount, you'll lose weight. And of course, uh, part of the book is, encouraging you to exercise and giving you some some helpful hints on how you can get over the inertia barrier. Mm. One of them is just get your gear on. Just say, well, I'm, I, I'm, I'm too tired to exercise, but I'm going to get my gear on. And once your gear's on, 
You say, well, do you, you know, really, that's kind of a waste if you don't at least stretch. So then you start stretching. And you say, well, you know, now that you're stretched, you might as well at least do a minute of exercise. <laughs> and then you minute. talk. So you talk yourself into it little by little. It's those kinds of things are what we have to offer in here. And uh, and and not uh, a don't... single recipe, not a single suggested no. way to eat. It's no, all and, about... and that's because I'll, what we have in here, there's a little story, a little uh, excerpt from the old Woody Allen movie Sleeper, mm -hmm. where he wakes, he's awakened after 200 years in a coma. Mm -hmm. And the futuristic in the future, and the doctors say, you know, ask him, you know, do you want anything to to special to eat? And he asks for um, organic honey, wheat germ, and tiger's milk, or some, you know, almond milk, or something like that. So, so one of the doctors says, why would he want something like that? And he said, oh, in those days, those were considered magical substances with life-preserving properties. And the other doctor says, you mean they didn't have deep fat or steak or cream pies or hot fudge? And he goes, no, people thought those were bad for you. And, and, and the other doctor says, yeah, but we've discovered that that's precisely opposite of what we've discovered to be true now. Those are, you know, so, so if you think so about true. food fads, everything changes and comes and goes. Was coffee bad for you? Oh, yeah. Oh, wait. A study just came out. Coffee's good for you. Was <laughs> wine bad for you? Yeah. Oh, wait. A study just came out. Wine's good for you. Is chocolate right. bad for you? You know? No. Is, is no. Something no. that you thought was bad for you, <laughs> wait a few months. Oh, it's good for you now. So why yeah, right. would, you know, so I don't want to put in recipes and high carb, low carb, high fat, low fat. You know, they all change of what you're supposed to well, eat or not eat. So right. So here's the exciting like in thing 14 about years. Yeah. Exciting thing about the best diet book ever. You it's it's based on a positive choice model. You get to eat whatever you want, whenever you want, and how much you want. You just gotta understand if you eat too much, too fast for too long, you're gonna gain weight. <laughs> <laughs> and if you if you choose, it's your choice. If you choose smaller portions and you eat more slowly and stop sooner, you'll lose weight. It's completely under your control rather than somebody else imprisoning you in some kind of diet that you're going to rebel against and quit. At what so, point did you come excited. up with the idea of going, okay, I, I've, I've done a lot of golf books. I, I got that covered. I'll try tennis. Where did dieting come from? This How has been that? in the hopper for 30 years. Oh, wow. But it was well, so well simple. It golf. was so simple. What I just described to you, I didn't have a book. I had yeah. to collect lots of ideas. And, and mindfulness was not as in vogue as now. So I yeah. had to wait for the world to catch up to the, uh, you know, when I first started this, I just decided to say no to seconds and snacking. And that was enough to lose weight if I kept yeah. everything else in my routine the same. So I didn't have to forego any particular foods. I just started eating smaller portions and, and stopping sooner. And, but that was the, the, we actually called a publisher, but there wasn't enough of a book in the 1980s to, to produce this, but I've always wanted to do it and make it available. And we finally got it done. So um, awesome. January 1st, it comes out. If you go to thebestdietbookever.com, you can uh, sign up for the quote of the week, and we will let you know when you can get it, where you can get it. And in fact, when it first comes out, it's going to be on Amazon, and it's going to be at a substantial discount for the first two weeks, I think. So that's the time to get it, first two weeks in June. Unbelievable. You know, we talked about Christy Kerr and, and the work you've done with her uh, uh, before, and I, I found this quote um, actually about your, your, your book and your help. And she said, I started winning tournaments after I lost 65 pounds. Losing the weight gave me the needed confidence to succeed. And I've kept the weight off for 14 years. This book can help you lose weight, feel more confident, and help you to have success in your own lives. Amazing. Congratulations, Doc. Thank That's you. Awesome. 
Thank you. Um, Christy had lost the weight before we started working, but it was very much similar principles to, to what I present in the book. And, uh, and that's really, I think, harder than losing weight for most people is keeping it off and not doing the yo-yo yeah. thing. And I have a chapter, the yo-yo way of life is in here. And that is <laughs> losing weight and then putting it back on and then losing it again and then putting it back on. Um, so Christy's been successful. Uh, she, she, 14 years ago when she was just a youngster on the tour and she lost the weight, changed her whole appearance, changed her confidence level and started winning and has won 17, 17 18 tournaments now. Wow. Uh, and I think second leading money winner of all time on the, on the tour. So phenomenal 38 phenomenal. years. So she, she, uh, gave those young, those young whippersnappers, a uh, a lesson <laughs> in the last tournament of the year. Um, so it was very exciting to, to see her come very through. Exciting. Well, congratulations and best of luck with the new book. Uh, if there's anybody in the audience right now uh, on Blab with us that would like to ask Dr. Joe a question, uh, you have the opportunity to either submit a question by typing what you see on the screen there, slash Q and your question. Or if you want to join in and ask Dr. Joe or myself a question for yourself, uh, please, there's there's an open uh, open seat right there. So it says call in, in call click in on button. them. There you go. Yeah, click on the call in button. And um, so we'll, you know, obviously we're going to wrap this up soon, but um, the diet thing, it's a beautiful segue because there are so many golfers that, you know, refuse to walk the golf course. Right. That are eating the entire time, that are drinking the entire time, and then they're wondering why they can't get the power that they used to. Right. I mean, there's exactly. so many elements involved and dieting is just part of it. Um, you know, flexibility and, and being in decent shape. But uh, I think that's important information for all golfers as well. So, you know, people might ask, um, how did I do with the uh, with the dieting? And so I want to show you a picture. Let me bring it up here. Sorry, audio podcast listeners. You don't get to see it, but. It, oh, yeah. Sorry about that. Sorry that's about that. okay. We'll put it. Well, I don't know if we'll be able to share that or not, but. Uh, we'll see what we can do. This? Okay. So a picture there? there's, the, there's the picture. And, and wait, what, that's of, is that you? That's me 30 years ago. So you were a high uh, school I'm wrestler? Sorry. That's me 50 years ago. <laughs> I was the captain there. That's I would have picture. I would have left it at thirty, Doc. I would. No, I was the, I was, the I was the captain of the wrestling team, and in I am school? I am back at that weight now. Yeah, in high school. Are you really? And I'm back at that. I'm 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 back at the weight at what I weighed there. One seventy eight. I was one. I was wrestling at one seventy eight. Oh, Oops, sorry, you got a call that. coming in. <laughs> there. Let's not do that. That's amazing. That is absolutely amazing. My son uh, was a high school wrestler for four years, and he he much lower weight. Um, but uh, I remember with the just what they had to go through, and he oh, yeah. still works out a lot, but he's not at that weight. So oh, what man. I'm going to do is someone suggested. My physical therapist suggested, why don't I get a wrestling singlet? and dress up and stand <laughs> up in the, and I'm going to do it. I'm going to get one and stand up in the same pose and we'll put that in a later edition of the book. Spray paint your hair. <laughs> That's great. Uh, Dr. <laughs> Joseph Parent, the best diet book ever. Zen golf, a classic. If you've not, if you are a golfer and do not have it on your shelf, you're not really a golfer. <laughs> Just gotta say it. You, you can't be claimed to be a golfer who wants to improve, make your life better, unless you have Zen Golf on your bookshelf. Yeah, I, want to, I want to encourage you. There are people who are not that much in the, interested in reading, but yeah. I recorded the audiobook. Oh, so you wow. Can listen, you can listen to it at go to zengolf.com, and right there you'll see the products in the audiobook. You can download it and uh, listen to it in pieces on the way to the golf course. Pick a chapter Perfect. on the way to the course. Uh, in addition to listening to the Golf Smarter podcast, of, of course. course. Well, you listen to the, <laughs> you listen to the Golf Smarter podcast, and then a chapter of Zen Golf, and then tee it up. There we go. I love it. 
All right, Doc. Well, I'm I'm just so excited for your new year, and the book is going to be out January 1st. And thank you again for helping me launch year 11 and year one. My pleasure. Smarter. It is always great to have you back on because just like reading the book one more time, it's like yes, got it. Oh, I'm so glad I heard that again. Well, we'll we'll stay thank together. Maybe we should do, make this annual instead of every 10 years. Uh, well, you what you've been on like nine or ten times already on the show, really? so I you will yeah you've been time on a lot. Flies. Time flies. Yeah, it sure has. Thanks so Sounds much, great. Doc. Happy Thank New you, Year, Fred. All right, bye bye.